This would not have been possible but for three sponsors, and we're very grateful to them. The American Wind Energy Association, Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions, and the National Natural Gas Supply Association. So thank you, thank you once again uh, for doing this. Um, thank you all for what you've been doing to support us, your confidence in us. Uh, it makes it uh, um, not only a job for me and my colleagues, but a real passion uh, in, these turbulent, in these turbulent times. Um, we, as I said earlier, what we try to base it on is credibility and bipartisanship, and uh, you, you help make it possible. Now, the surprise. The first surprise you heard was about our great George David Banks, and I thank you for giving him a round of applause. Um, I think it's wonderful that he's going back into public service. Now, the second bit of surprise is she doesn't expect it, but I do want to thank Frederick Schroeder, our event planner over there, because you know how hard it is to organize events. So join me in giving her a round of applause. And now, another one, and that is I want to give special thanks to Dr. Pena Chebi, our Senior Vice President and Chief Economist. She helped put it together. She's playing, going to play an important role in it today, and more importantly, as the Chief Economist and Senior Vice President of the American Council for Capital Formation. But for her, we would not uh, be where we are. So thank you, Pinar for pulling it together, and now I'm lucky I get to fade from the stage, and it's all yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for coming in. I know you're not here to hear me, so a short introduction, but before we start, I would like to thank the chairman staff for their hard work to pull this event together. Thank you. Um, um, I would like to welcome Chairman Chatterjee on stage, and I cannot thank Two better people, I cannot think of two better people than Dina Wiggins, President and CEO of Natural Gas Supply Association, and Amy Farrell, of, um, Senior Vice President of American Wind and Energy Association, to, to lead the discussion with their immense experience in energy field. But before I turn it over to them, please, you know, welcome, please, to the stage. Um, please, um, before I turn it over to Dina for the questions, since I organized this, I would like to ask the first question for the chairman. Um, and I'm waiting for him. Yeah, he's, he's ready, I guess. Chairman, would you mind elaborating for three or four minutes for the top three issues on FERC agenda in 2019? Then you're free to discuss. We're going to discuss uh, for half an hour, and we will stop for the audience questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for the question and for the, uh, the opportunity to be here today. It's uh, great to see a lot of uh, familiar faces in the room, um, faces that I've known for a long time, many of whom uh, I don't ever see at FERC, so uh, <laughs> I hope to keep this uh, discussion uh, interesting for, uh, for you all, but uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, this is uh, uh, an exciting uh, and, and, and also challenging time to be at the Commission. Uh, there are so many, uh, we're, we're at such a critical juncture uh, in America's energy future and uh, there are so many critical uh, uh, elements, cases, policy issues that have come before the commission uh, that we're in the process of ta uh, tackling. Uh, you know, it's hard to put a, a top three or kind of uh, uh, rank order the, the significance because all of the issues are, are very significant in different sectors of the economy. Some of the areas um, where my focus has been um, have been on the project side. Uh, uh, I'm very uh, pleased that uh, in the past uh, couple of months we've uh, approved three major uh, LNG export facilities, which I think, uh, uh, as I've said, has got significant implications for the U.S. Uh, uh, domestically, economically, uh, geopolitically, and environmentally. And I think uh, I'm very proud of the work that the Commission has done there. Uh, we continue to deal with the vexing challenge uh, of looking at uh, our uh, uh, energy and capacity markets 
Uh, I'm a big believer in markets, but I'm also a big believer uh, in states' rights and uh, in the uh, ability for states and local governments to make decisions about their own energy futures. And what we are seeing is a collision of those two things where uh, states are taking actions that are having an impact on uh, the competitive wholesale markets and uh, FERC is, uh, is is struggling with how to uh, to, to, to reconcile and, and move forward in those situations, trying to honor states' rights while also ensuring uh, the integrity of the of the markets before us. Um, I've made transmission uh, a big uh, focus of mine. I think building out the grid of the future, a grid uh, that uh, is uh, flexible uh, and resilient um, is uh, essential to taking advantage of this incredible uh, American energy opportunity. Uh, we recently uh, opened up in, uh, 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 NOIs to look at our policy on incentives to make sure we're incentivizing the right kinds of transmission. Um, as well as looking at, uh, at how we calculate uh, uh, ROEs, uh, and as that's a significant part in ensuring that, uh, that we're incentivizing the right kind of investments to make sure that that grid of the future uh, is in place. Uh, I also, you know, perhaps as part of that docket, perhaps as a separate exercise, uh, but being cognizant that I don't want to bite off more than we can chew, I want to look at Order 1000, which for those of you who follow the FERC space deals with uh, competitive transmission. Um, I'm a big believer in competition and the benefits of cost discipline, but now nearly a decade into Order 1000's uh, uh, existence, I think everyone can agree that it's not working the way that it was intended to, uh, to work. That's where the agreement stops because uh, then when you start to sort through what to do to fix it, um, you get into a lot of challenges, but I think it's a challenge uh, worth tackling. Um, some other really significant things on our plate. Uh, PERPA is something that uh, uh, you know played a significant role uh, when it was first uh, introduced in the late 1970s. I think the energy landscape has changed so much since then that it's time to bring PERPA into the 21st century. Major changes to PERPA need to come through Congress, but I think that in the absence of that, there are things that the Commission can do within our own regulations to help modernize PERPA, uh, and that is something that we're hoping to tackle. And then finally, um, as I uh, talk about you know the grid of the future and all of the exciting opportunities uh, that that await America uh, as a result of you know this uh, te tremendous technological innovation that's taking place in the energy space. Uh, that technological innovation comes with a with a downside risk, and that is uh, increased vulnerability uh, to both physical and cyber uh, security threats on our infrastructure. I think uh, uh, the state of uh, uh, of, our, of our security posture. Uh, and, and really, modern warfare has changed to an extent that now private companies that previously have not had to focus on these things have to factor in security considerations because they find themselves, uh, uh, you know, vulnerable to this uh, to this new form of uh, of warfare. Uh, and our adversaries are aware of this, and uh, and uh, we all in government, state, federal level, and the private sector have to be vigilant in the face of this. Uh, so that's a lot to digest. I think we've only got 30 minutes, and so uh, I'll go ahead for uh, my former Senate colleagues and file cloture on myself and uh, yield back uh, my available time and uh, take whatever questions you guys may have. All right, well, I think you started with a lot of the topics I was going to ask you questions about, oh, so perfect. maybe I should yield back the balance of my time as well. But just delving into to one area that you were talking about, transmission and infrastructure, we're sitting up here, we've got AWEA, the renewables in industry represented, natural gas industry represented, and you know, we think that we're a pretty good partner with each other in terms of supplying the grid, that we're there when there's some in intermittency in the renewable space. Do you think there's more that we could be doing to work together on transmission and infrastructure issues? I, I do think we're natural partners. Maybe, maybe you can talk about that a little bit. I, I think the natural partnership is, uh, is there, and I think it is, as you said, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the, the way that I think uh, wind and gas in particular have come together to you know, ensure that we're able to transition to a cleaner uh, energy economy without compromising uh, the reliability and resilience of the grid is, uh, is essential. But I think, again, um, getting the right transmission built uh, in the places of the country where we need uh, to foster is going to be critical to, uh, to continuing to, to build on this. We need to ensure that uh, the infrastructure is in place is to, it, to get the wind resource from where the generation is to where the demand for that uh, for that power is, and I think you know part of that again. Um, I think 
uh, we've seen benefits of competition and the cost discipline that arises from competition uh, that, can, uh, uh, that can be effective. But then we at the commission, I think, need to look at the way that we are evaluating um, you know, our incentives and our ROEs to make sure, are we incentivizing the right kind of transmission that will best benefit consumers? And that's the lens I kind of want to look through this on is what is in the best interest of consumers? The current approach that we take to, 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 to evaluating how to incentivize these investments is to look at the risks of a project. Right. And uh, maybe that's the approach that needs to be continued in the future, but maybe we can also take a, a holistic look at, and see uh, how we can go about setting policies in place that you guys can continue to build upon the partnership that you have. Um, by opening with a notice of inquiry, our hope is to hear from stakeholders throughout the process and hopefully many people in this room so we can help build out that robust record and, uh, and, 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 and take a serious look at how to, how to uh, uh, make sure that we are in a position from a policy standpoint to enable that grid of the future. You know, I know you teed it off by saying you didn't want to bite off more than you could chew, but when we think about the incentives uh, notice, that looks at the technology in, in real time, but you, you also mentioned looking at things holistically, and that's an area where we think there's an opportunity for a more holistic look, particularly of the benefits of transmission in the Order 1000 process. Um, and I wonder if there's something you guys can think of that you would do in that process as, as it looks to considering both, because um, you want to consider the economic, the reliability, and the public policy needs. So do you have thoughts on how you might look at Order 1000? So again, I feel like if you take a, a, a comprehensive look at Order 1000 in conjunction with the look at ROEs and, and incentives. I worry that that is going to get too heavy and then the whole thing collapses. So what I want to do is, uh, with my team, with the incredible staff at the commission and in conversations with stakeholders, look at are there targeted things that we can do um, to, to, to better align Order 1000 with what it's original intention was and you know maybe it is looking specifically at the competition piece um, uh, looking at carve outs looking to see you know are there changes that we can make uh, within our policies to get the benefits of that cost discipline and technological innovation that uh, order 1000 was initially um, supposed to harvest um, obviously again you pull at one strand of order 1000 and it yanks at others and you get into things like you know interregional planning and 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 there are some complexities to that, and I'm, I'm very sensitive to that. Uh, I think we've got the NOIs in place. Um, I want to be ambitious. I want to solve problems. I want to make Order 1000 work. But I understand you have to be very, very careful uh, as you go about this. One of the things that we've been looking at recently, and one of our consultants put a map together for us that looked at all of the renewable fuel standards that the various states have put into place and have looked at and I was out in a conference. Renewable that, portfolio standards. Yeah, right. Uh, renewable fuels. Uh, and sorry. Oh renewable portfolio. Sorry. <laughs> you're right. back to my the, days the, of agriculture <laughs> policy. No, 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 no. We're not going to work back there. No, no, I know. No, don't want to talk about that. Well, I do have a corner for question, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, but well, renewable portfolio standards. And there are a number of states, as you know, have, have passed various targets and, and put numbers out there that they want to attain. And I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and a gentleman from MISO, and they're looking at it regionally because all these different states have different targets. And then the question is, how does MISO sort of address that and deal with that on a, on a regional basis when the different states are out there doing different things? Is that something that is of concern to you and, and, and how FERC is going to respond to that? Do you think the the RTOs are going to figure that out, and, and or do you think that's a vulnerability going forward? I, I think you know people keep asking me the question, and I want to be careful because uh, I mentioned earlier this collision of state policies and the markets, right. and right. we do have some pending contested matters before us, and so I can't speak to any particular sure. matters. So I can only speak it, you know, from a macro level. But people have asked me, so okay, like you know, is there is this is this intersection of state policy and competitive markets, you know, is this something that there's a singular action that you can take that will resolve it for the foreseeable future, and people will have that clarity and going forward. And the reality is, I, you know, I think the particular focus has been on a couple of states, and you know, uh, the Zex in a couple of states. And again, I'll leave it at that, right. and people can follow it. I don't want to cross uh, 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 into a pending contested matter, but um, you know, these. these it's the similar type of situation. States are going to take actions that are going to have an impact within the markets, and. Um, 
because I can't speak directly to it, I will speak to what a former Frick commissioner, a former colleague of mine, Tony Clark, he wrote an excellent white paper, I think, where he talked about, you know, the decision here is to either, you know, take a hard, make a hard decision and either apply a minimum offer price rule to everything or apply a minimum offer price rule to nothing and accommodate all state policies. And if you try and do anything up the middle, you're going to get crushed. That right. was the premise of his paper. Well, the reality is, the painful reality is, is while it seems simple, minimum offer price rule, everything or nothing, make a decision and go, there are significant downsides to either one of those approaches. So these states, which are wanting to take steps through their renewable portfolio standards to you know, essentially prop up the type of generation that they want for their, for their local in, economies and local environments, if you were to offer a minimum, make a subject to a minimum offer price rule, essentially c consumers in those states would have to be paying twice to get that resource if the state opted to continue with that resource. That's a significant downside risk. On the other side, if you go ahead and accommodate all state policies, then that really brings into question the, the functioning of the markets. And so that's my long-winded senatorial way of saying this is a really, really complex <laughs> challenge, and it's not one that's going away anytime soon. But I am a big believer in, in these markets about the, the efficiencies that these markets have brought, uh, the, the, the reduction in cost to consumers. You know, retail electric rates are down 12% since you know, 1990. A lot of factors have uh, played into that, but I think the markets have played an important role in that. And I think there have been environmental benefits as well. If you look at uh, power sector carbon emissions in the US, we're again, we're at 1990s levels. We've seen huge reductions. We're squeezing carbon out of the power sector. And that's largely a, uh, uh, the benefit of these markets. So I want these markets to work, but I also want to respect states' rights. And that's a very difficult thing to tackle. I guess following on to that, a lot of the reason behind some of the renewable portfolio standards, it's, it's about resource mix, but some of it's been carbon related too. And I know there's the uh, work going on up in ISO New England. It, you know, you guys have taken steps already in price formation. Do you have thoughts on whether internalizing that price of carbon in, is something that could be the next step in price formation, or how, how would you, could so you I, make that market? I, I want to be careful there because, again, there are actions taking place in some of the RTOs and ISOs that may come up to the commission, and I don't want to, you know, prejudge how we might deal with some of those things. So I'll just speak, you know, from a macro level. Um, you know, look, I've been pretty, pretty vocal that, you know, I'm a Republican. Uh, from Kentucky, who believes that we need to take steps to, to mitigate carbon emissions. Um, I think from my vantage point, the way to do that, I, I'm not uh, a proponent uh, of a carbon tax or of, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, regulation. I, I believe in market forces, uh, and I think we have a positive example that we've seen in the U.S. power sector where, we have a regulatory ecosystem, um, and the commission has played a significant role with orders like 841 on breaking down barriers to battery storage technology to en enable storage to be compensated for all of its attributes. Um, uh, uh, our generation interconnection rules to, to better facilitate you know, the interconnections that can enable the flourishment of new technologies. We're currently uh, looking into rulemaking on how to similarly break down barriers to aggregated uh, distributed energy resources. You know, these are the types of actions that can create a regulatory ecosystem that can enable newer, cleaner technologies, more efficient technologies to flourish. And I think that in uh, combination with you know, the increased deployment of, of, of cleaner sources that we've seen to date in the markets, driven by consumer demand and by economics, by the, by, mm -hmm. by the low cost of, uh, of gas and the increasingly falling cost of renewables. Um, I think what we've seen is uh, a, a cleaner grid that is squeezing carbon out of the power sector without compromising affordability or reliability. And I'm optimistic when I talk about US LNG exports that we can see that then happen globally. Because at the end of the day, the challenge of mitigating carbon emissions, it's a global challenge, not one that the US can face in isolation. And I think if we can get clean US LNG to displace dirtier sources of energy in other parts of the world, um, not only does that have geopolitical significance, but it has environmental benefit as well. And so um, from my vantage point, that's the approach that, uh, that, that I would like to see. One final point, um, I see my good friend Zach Begg over here, so I want to embarrass him very quickly. Uh, I'm a big believer in, uh, in nuclear power. I think uh, uh, nuclear power 
uh, as, as currently our single you know, most significant source of carbon-free baseload generation, uh, is, uh, is, is, is that there's value there from a carbon mitigation standpoint. And I'm hopeful um, uh, that, uh, that nuclear power will play a role in, uh, in our approach to, uh, to, to dealing with uh, global carbon mitigation. You were talking a lot about climate and a, and a cleaner, cleaner environment going forward. What do you think, and I don't want to get into any pending matter, so we'll, we'll sort of try to keep this at a higher level. What do you see FERC's role as in looking at greenhouse gas emissions and that sort of issue, type of issue, when you're looking at pipeline certificate orders and LNG projects and things of that nature? So this is one where, again, uh, uh, as I mentioned, you know, I'm a conservative who believes that we need to take steps to mitigate carbon emissions. But I also believe in a narrow interpretation of statute. And, 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 and for me, my interpretation of Section 7 of the Natural Gas Act, Congress did not give us the authority to do the kind of GHG analysis that some have called for. And I think for us to alter the way that we approach our certificate policy statement, or our certificate policy approach, I would need to see that direction come from, from Congress, from the legislative branch. I'm a big believer uh, in Article I. I you know, my origins are in the legislative branch. And uh, uh, absent that direction from Congress, um, I, am, uh, I am reluctant to alter the commission's policy without that direction, although I'm very cognizant that, uh, that the courts may well intervene here. Quite a number of cases pending on that. Yeah. We'll see, right? Um, you mentioned initially transmission as a big priority, and you talked about the incentives program. I think when we look back to EPAC 2005 and sort of the, the lofty goals uh, there about setting particular long distance transmission, um, do you have thoughts on things that FERC or DOE could do to actually help us realize some of the goals? Because I think, you know, we talked about the challenges of pipeline and transmission siding, but we, we looked back, and over the last decade, I think it's been a uh, 10 to 1 mile ratio in terms of pipelines to transmission. So we see a, a real burning need to sort of move things forward. Do you have thoughts on what FERC could do, or are there other reforms needed? I, I mean, that's why I think one of the reasons that we, we commenced with the two NOIs is we we're cognizant that it has been 15 years since, uh, since EPAC 05, nearly 15 years, and it, it, and it was time for a refresh. To see it, and the energy landscape has changed, and now we have a decade and a half of data to look back upon to see if, in fact, what was intended in EPAC 05 has come to fruition. And what we're hopeful for is in examining that question of, okay, are we going about this the right way? Are we incenting the right type of transmission to be built? Um, that's what I'm hopeful that that stakeholder feedback, that that building of the record will, will enable us to do just that. In the meantime, do you see any opportunity or space into ramping up quarter designation or? Uh, I mean, I think, let's see how this process okay. plays out. <laughs> Okay, okay, I just want to check time here, make sure right. we can still continue to chat. Uh, you mentioned something earlier about what FERC's trying to do to make sure that newer technologies can come into play, and that, that's sort of something that we at NGSA sort of look at and look around the corner and try to figure out what's the new thing that's around the corner. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit more about that and the possibility for battery storage coming into play and some other what we might consider now disruptive technologies that in a few years are going to be ordinary and not disruptive? They'll be part of what we deal with every day. So, you know, I'm a big, uh, big believer and a big proponent of, uh, of, of store battery storage technology. And, and I do think it has the capacity to be, you know, a, a fundamental game changer that could alter the way that we, you know, generate, distribute, and consume power in this country. And uh, again, I think we've already seen tremendous innovation in that, in that space. And, and I think we'll continue to see uh, innovation there. I think the idea of storage technology co-located with solar, co-located with wind, you know, has the capacity to, to address some of the resiliency questions, some of the reliability mm -hmm. questions, some of the intermittency questions um, that, uh, that have, uh, you know, that could really lead to, to uh, a dramatic increase in the deployment of, uh, of, of, of renewable technologies. And I'm very excited by that. Um, you know, obviously, FERC is not, you know, an innovator, you know, DOE has an office that looks at this. But one of the cool things about being in this job and with my prior role uh, in the Senate is, you get to meet with people from around the country, around the world, who are you know, promoting uh, some of these, uh, these new technologies. And so it'll, it'll be interesting to see what, uh, 
what those opportunities are. Uh, I'm uh, actually headed out next, next week to speak at uh, the Aspire uh, uh, Forum, an energy forum, a technology forum in Silicon Valley. And uh, um, uh, uh, Bloom Energy and you know, K.R. Sridhar, their founder, will be there. And you know, the advancements that he has made with his technology are, are remarkable. Um, one of the reasons I think better aligning PERPA with the 21st century realities of the marketplace is we have these new technologies that have come online since PERPA was implemented that PERPA didn't envision what it defined as, you know, as, as co-generation. And I think you know, that uh, yields some exciting possibilities. And what you're also seeing is when you have a regulatory ecosystem that allows new resources, new technologies to be compensated, that just drives innovation. Again, that's one of the values of, uh, of competition. I think what Order 1000 envisioned in the transmission space is that competition would drive this innovation. And what you're seeing now is more and more players coming into uh, uh, to this space. So there's been so much focus, you know, on Tesla and some of the other, uh, uh, you know, automotive companies in the in the battery storage space. Uh, I saw recently like Dyson is getting into the storage game, and that's an example of you know uh, of competition incentivizing people to, to push. And, and, and I think when you have that competition and you have that incentive to move forward, um, I think positive uh, innovation will be a natural result. And I'm excited about it. So, so. I mean, I, I did have one other thought in response to the MISO thing. And not surprisingly, it links back to transmission planning. But um, you know, when we look back uh, years before, you could argue that the public policy that's happened over the last decade has also been a big ramp up in the shift. And you also look back to the, the planning process that created the MVP lines, where they did consider collectively you know, what the, the economic reliability and policy pieces. And that, that's in the past. And I think as we look forward, that that could be the solution going off, um, going forward. And you mentioned the consumer cost piece in studying up for this. Uh, I was kind of looking back through stuff and found a factoid, the EIPC study, remember when DOE did that with Nehru, and they looked at the, the concept of you know, kind of mandating this anticipatory planning and look ahead, and they showed that I think it was like 90 billion in net benefits for consumers based on that versus the traditional generation only. So just kind of a food for thought as you look for a narrow way to approach Order 1000, maybe that angle on an anticipatory and, and looking at that uh, cross current could be a way to really make a very consumer focused savings. I don't know if you're, could be, if you're taking a list, we'll, we'll, we'll surely be at your door, but didn't know if you have thoughts on that. I just again, uh, on its face, that definitely seems like something we could look at. What I would need to look at holistically, though, is if you pull at that thread, mm -hmm. what, what comes with it. And right. Again, and, and that's the complexity of, of getting into something as big as Order 1000 was. And again, you were commenting on this earlier. And again, cognizant of not wanting to ask you to comment on something that's pending. So again, at, at a little bit of a high level here. We see a little bit, of, maybe a lot, of tension between some of the state programs that offer subsidies in various and assorted ways and what FERC tries to do and does do on a broader basis of planning and trying to support competitive markets. We're concerned about those two things butting into each other mm -hmm. and what the outcome will be. Can you talk a little bit about that, again, at a high level? I mean, again, that's at the crux of what you know I, I said earlier about yeah. the pending matters before us about the state RPS. I mean, it's uh, uh, it, it, it's if it were easy, we would have solved it already. Um, and you know, there are definite, distinct decisions that can be made and steps that can be taken. But you have to understand that you know there are consequences to those decisions as well. And uh, uh, again, not to just keep repeating myself, but trying to ensure the integrity of these markets while also being respectful of states' rights uh, is a challenge. I have you know, some who come to me and say, hey, uh, I'm a big believer in states' rights as well, but when you join a competitive, you know, organized wholesale market, you sort of cede your state autonomy at the door. Uh, so go ahead, you know, go with a strict minimum offer uh, price rule and try and purify these markets. And if states don't want to pay for you know, the resource twice, then they shouldn't have those policies in place. Well. Again, without getting too far into certain matters, the uh, frame it as a hypothetical. You know, certain states could drop out of these markets if we take a step to try and purify the markets and not accommodate mm -hmm. state policies. And then what you would have is a shrinking or potentially, you know, implosion of uh, of the existing markets that we have. And I think that would be a shame because, as I mentioned, I think we've seen tremendous benefits to those. And so, 
Um, uh, I share the same concerns that, that, that you guys are having about this, but uh, uh, you know, we want to make sure that the markets continue to function. And if, as more and more states start to take action, if FERC takes you know, the, the, the affirmative federal step of saying, we're going to have pure markets, state policies, you know, there's no room for accommodation, you got to pay twice, that could have broader consequences for markets as well. I think it's good to open it up. Since we have another 18 minutes uh, with the chairman. Oh, wow. All right. <laughs> That's okay. I have a loud voice. I think I should share that with the audience. Um, put the picture on the screen. Can you have some questions from the audience? And please, before your question, introduce yourself and your organization. Who has the microphone? Lisa Hancock from Foundation for Resilient Societies. Um, in light of your comments uh, about resiliency, I was wondering uh, what your perspective is on the uh, EPRI report on EMP that was released today. I have not had a, a chance to, uh, to to review it yet. Um, uh, obviously, you know, it just came out today, and I think uh, uh, we we'll want to consult not just with uh, the team at the commission, but with our uh, our peers at NERC as well and get their, their sense of it. Thank you. Tom Tiernan with the FOSS report. Uh, the discussion focused a lot on state issues um, that are at a crossroads as, as was mentioned. And there's a pending, um, not a pending, there's, there's an open commissioner spot. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts on um, the value of having a former state regulator at the commission, or if you have any um, insights on what the White House might be thinking, or any any thoughts on timing on when you'll get a full complement and, and the value of a state regulator at the commission. I have I have no insight into uh, uh, the nominations confirmation process whatsoever. That'll be a decision for the White House and the U.S. Senate. What I will say, though, to to answer your question, you know, we've been struggling with these challenges for a while, and I learned a lot from Commissioner Rob Paulson during uh, during his brief tenure at the commission. Um, and he was struggling with these issues uh, as well. And so uh, I think certainly there's, uh, there's value in the input of state regulators who have this uh, experience. But I can tell you, I don't think the, the, the current difficulties we're having with addressing this have anything to do with a 2-2 split on the commission or any kind of partisan or ideological divide. These are just really, really complex issues that I think all of my colleagues uh, are struggling with. And so, like I said, we don't currently have a state regulator on the panel, but up until last August, we did, and we still struggled to, to, to move on these issues uh, because Commissioner Paulson, as he made that transition from state regulator to federal regulator, uh, I think you know he was a big believer in markets, um, but also came from a state commission and similarly struggled with how to reconcile uh, how he would have handled such a situation when he was chair of the Pennsylvania Commission vis-a-vis -vis his belief in, in, in the benefits uh, of markets. And so, um, so I think uh, uh, to me this, this, this challenge is so complex. Um, it is not something that I think will be resolved by this iteration of the, I think it will take multiple years, multiple commissions to, to address this, because as to Dina's point, states are gonna continually you know, take actions. And so I think it's a, it's a mistake to try and view such a complicated challenge through the lens <coughs> of short-term dynamics on the commission. I, I mean, you know, again, we don't speak to, you know, pending matters or timing before matters before the commission, but I think, you know, again, pointing to the, uh, the success or ability to get those LNG 
project approvals out. Uh, quite frankly, um, from the time that um, uh, we first restored the quorum uh, to the commission after a seven month period of loss of quorum in August of 2017, we've acted on, I don't even know how many BCF a day of, of pipeline capacity. We've gotten a lot of projects out the door. Um, and so uh, I don't know off the top of my head, you know, what's in the queue right now, but I'm not concerned about it. Any other questions? I'll pop in with a question while perhaps somebody else is thinking of one. And it's sort of along the lines of, of pipeline projects. Former Chairman McIntyre opened up a review of the certificate policy statement in there. Some of us, at least in this room, who think it's withstood the test of time and is worked well at the commission and worked well for the applicants, but that docket is, is still open and pending. Uh, can you talk a little bit about where you see that going and any, any timeline for action? Yeah, thank you for that. So, you know, I think when, when Chairman McIntyre um, uh, made the decision to open the review of the certificate policy statement, um, he was very clear to me, and I think I, I shared the view, that that wasn't in any way an indictment of our 1999 policy statement. It was simply a recognition that, you know, as regulators, we could always find ways to, to do our jobs better. Um, from my vantage point, from Chairman McIntyre's vantage point, we had a concern that um, the, the process was taking too long, and we wanted to find ways that we could improve the timeline for project approvals without sacrificing safety or environmental compliance. And, and in recognition that many of our, our, our orders are now, if not all, are winding up in the courts, that, right. that we had a durable system in place to ensure the legal integrity of our orders. Um, you know, as we've heard you know, from stakeholders in this process, what we're finding is many commenters are saying that the existing policy statement is, is, is good law. And I want to make clear to everybody, it is still good policy, good mm -hmm. law today. And, and uh, uh, if we can find a way to, to improve our process, uh, we will certainly try to do that. Um, this is something that, to Tom's earlier question, I do think for something like a policy statement to be durable, that is something that it's really important that you have, I think, um, not just you know, consensus, but unanimous bipartisan consensus. Because again, the reason that our policy statement has been in place since 1999 through all sorts of variations in the commission's membership is because it's good policy, um, it has withstood the test of time to date. And I wanna make sure, and my colleagues would all agree, that any changes we make going forward um, be durable. And so a split you know, policy statement, um, I don't think uh, has that much value. And so I think with, with a vacancy on the commission, um, with, uh, with Commissioner Floor uh, announcing that she was not seeking another term, um, I think that's an area where we need to move quickly when we have our, our full complement uh, uh, on the commission so that we can take action. That doesn't mean, though, that we're going to wait for that. I think uh, my colleagues and I uh, uh, want to continue to, to not just evaluate the record, but I've had great meetings um, with landowners in particular. I've had uh, sympathy with uh, uh, the plight of landowners who it is not their responsibility to track FERC dockets and be aware of the timing of things and what their mitigation rights might be and you know, the timeline for, for restoration. Um, I think it is incumbent upon those of us who are involved in the regulatory process as well as project sponsors to really effectively work with and communicate with, uh, with landowners to ensure that they are aware of everything that's happening, what their rights are. And I've also been impressed as I've met with landowners who have come in and voiced their concerns with project sponsors coming in and in great detail for me laying out the steps they are in fact taking to, uh, to work with landowners. And so I think just even having this dialogue and, and by myself, Commissioner Glick, being out there voicing our concerns for landowner rights, you're seeing you know, a, a concerted effort on the part of project sponsors. Um, you know, particularly, I've been pleased in, in certain examples we've seen when it comes to, to restoration and how quickly and diligently they're moving on restoration. And so um, I think uh, we will continue, my, the, the current uh, uh, members on the commission, working uh, towards this. And then we await our new colleagues. And, and hopefully, we'll be able to uh, either produce a new durable policy statement for the future or affirm that our 1999 policy statement is, is still good law. 
Thank you. So what you're saying is that not all landowners know how to go on e-library and, and track all the dockets? Uh, I think not all FERC lawyers know how to go on e-library. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. I think <laughs> FERC lawyers know how to do that, but, but I take your point. I do think that, that the developers have learned a lot in, in the last however many years and have really taken great pains to go out and have meetings and town meetings and county meetings and individual meetings and I think they've learned that not doing that is a problem. Yeah, I, I, you know, they also recognize that the relationship with the landowners, you know, that's, that's in, in some instances a multi-decade relationship right. and they need to get that right. And they, 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 I, I've been impressed by the response that I've seen thus far to some of the concerns that I've raised. We'd be remiss if we didn't ask about a very uh, important and timely topic any Kentucky Derby picks. <laughs> so, oh. I got to tell you, you put me on the spot. I got my tie on and everything. It is Tuesday, and I haven't even had a chance. It's been, this is the first, this is the most ill prepared I've ever been for a Kentucky Derby. Can you come back uh, on Friday and tell us I what you think? I don't know if I'll have it. I mean, I got to, I, I got to, you know, do, do, my, do my research over the next couple of days if I have time. But uh, this is it. Last year, I was locked in on Justify. And everybody was betting against him because there was this, you know, curse that no, you know, horse that hadn't run at a two-year-old had ever won the Derby as a three-year-old, and 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 so all the money was going elsewhere. And I loaded up on Justify, and it worked out well for me. I rested <laughs> on my laurels this year, and I had I, I didn't watch the Arkansas Derby, the Florida Derby. I am so ill prepared, but that's just a sign to all you stakeholders. I've been working hard. I haven't had time. <laughs> <laughs> We should let him end on that. Say, that but I, was a great <laughs> one to end I don't on. know that I can yeah. let him end on so such uh, such, <laughs> such a fun issue. I might have to talk about cybersecurity. We can do that. We can do that for two minutes. Um, that is something that you've spent a lot of time looking at and, and talking about publicly. It seems to me from your public comments that you're getting more comfortable with the combination of what we have now in place and what the pipelines are, are doing voluntarily. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, so for the folks who maybe aren't tracking that as closely, the issue is, um, you know, FERC has the responsibility for, you know, certificating these, these, these pipeline applications. Um, uh, we regulate their the, the approvals and their rates, but the security of these pipelines falls to TSA, the Transportation Security Administration. So the same agency that's responsible for our aviation safety and the safety of our highways and, and the safety uh, of our railroads is also responsible for overseeing the security of our network of pipelines. And um, I was concerned, uh, my colleague Commissioner Glick were concerned that uh, because of the increasing interdependence of gas and the power sector, uh, that this was something that could have graver risk today than it did in the past. I think 20 years ago, if, uh, uh, if a single gas pipeline went out, a generator might not have even flinched. Today, when you might have eight or nine generators tied to a single pipeline, um, an outage could have significant and cascading consequences, and our adversaries know that. And so uh, uh, currently, you know, uh, uh, pipelines uh, uh, under TSA are subject to, to voluntary guidelines. So again, this was something that Commissioner Glick and I raised as an issue, and I've been very impressed with the response that I've seen, not just from, uh, uh, from industry, but from TSA as well. I've had multiple meetings with the uh, administrator, David Pekoski. He participated in a joint technical conference we had on security investments at the commission that we did uh, with DOE. He has committed to me personally, um, and our staffs are working together um, to, to put additional personnel Resources, you know, I think they only had like four people responsible for the entire network of pipelines. They're going to dramatically increase that. Um, I think um, uh, industry uh, has certainly taken steps to make greater investments because it's incumbent in, in the industry's interest. They don't want, you know, the, these, these outages to take place. Uh, so I've been impressed with the response, uh, but we have to remain, you know, vigilant on this. There was a GAO report that came out last year that pointed to a lot of, you know, deficiencies in, in, in our security posture here. And I'm very sensitive to those, and I'm going to be vigilant and stay on top of that. But thus far, um, I think, you know, there are a lot of people who immediately call for mandatory uh, uh, standards. Mandatory standards are one solution, but they're not the only solution. Um, and I, for one, feel that there's been such a positive response from DHS, from TSA, from industry, 
um, that I want to continue. They, they, they came in good faith and said, you know, uh, uh, Commissioner, please, you know, hear us out. These are the steps that we're taking. We, we take this very, very seriously. We understand uh, the, the, the risks of our new security reality. Uh, and I think you know you've got to when people come and work in good faith, you gotta you gotta continue to work with them. Um, so this is gonna be something that I remain uh, I'm gonna remain uh, very very vigilant on. Good, thank you. Can I name, if you don't mind, since we have a couple of minutes, um, and to give the chairman a break, the concluding remarks from the perspective of your industry, and then maybe the chairman can you know throw in a couple of sentences in there too. What do you think? Well. I agree with, I think, everything he said. How about that? No. 99.9% .9 of what he said. We don't expect to, to always agree with our regulators. What we ask for and what we hope for is people who are thoughtful and take these big issues that we're all grappling with very seriously. And clearly, the, the chairman fits that bill to a T. And we're very grateful for his leadership and the care with which we, he is approaching all of these issues. As, as he said when we were talking about some of the, the states versus the federal issues, these are tough issues. And from the gas industry's perspective, really what we're looking for and hoping for is careful consideration and that in evaluating all of these fuels that can be an important part of our economy, that gas is given a fair shake in this. We don't want to be given an advantage. We don't want to be given a disadvantage. And I think the 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 remarks that the chairman has made here tells me that FERC is on exactly that sort of path, and we're very grateful. I will echo part of that and, and say that I think one of the biggest challenges is when uh, the chairman went through the opening remarks that hit on so many things that are important to the industry, and you could tell from the questions uh, things that are particularly important uh, to us and, and important for what you recognize is both resilience and, and lowering consumer, consumer costs is, is uh, cracking the nut on getting more transmission, partic particularly long distance, because that does offer not only consumer savings, but real benefits and, and resilience. And we appreciate your remarks on both of those topics and look forward to working with the commission. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you Thank for you. Uh, for the questions. And again, I want to ask you, as I look around the room, and, and you know, it was bright initially, and I was getting asked tough questions, but I'm seeing so many people that you know have been working diligently on these issues for a long time. I'm just looking around the room and seeing folks that I worked on EPACT 03 and EPACT 05 with, and now you know the fact that we're at a point where we're going back and taking a look at those things. Uh, it's great to, to have uh, uh, so much uh, experience uh, to draw upon in this room. So thank you for all, you all for your participation. And Mr. Chairman and panelists, thank you on behalf of the American Council for Traffic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.